BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. And hello everybody, today is Friday, another Cooper Friday, welcome to the show, how's everybody doing? On Fridays this year I've been talking to you guys about D.B. Cooper, the man responsible for the only unsolved skyjacking in U.S. aviation history. And there are a couple things I would like to go over before we truly begin. Firstly, there are two episodes of the show, The Cooper Vortex, that I recommend. The first one is with Stuart McAdam, who has been a guest on Black Box Online Radio in the past, and he runs the website paidadvertisinghelp.com, and I'll be responding to some things from his episode near the end. But Darren Schaefer, who hosts The Cooper Vortex, also did an interview with Stan Siegel, talking all about the D.B. Cooper connections to Titanium, because D.B. Cooper boarded a flight going from Portland to Seattle, under the name of Dan Cooper, he had what appeared to have been a bomb, and he held everybody hostage on the plane, demanding four parachutes and $200,000 ransom. And after the plane landed in Seattle, he successfully obtained that. After some discussions, they agreed to fly to Reno, Nevada, and D.B. Cooper lowered the back aft staircase and jumped out and parachuted into the night never to have been seen or heard from again, although some people insist that they have identified D.B. Cooper and they know exactly who he was. And what happened after that is D.B. Cooper left behind several items on the plane. He smoked Raleigh cigarettes, he drank bourbon and soda from a glass, and he left behind his clip-on tie, which I'll be discussing in this episode. And more or less, Darren Schaefer was interviewing someone, Stan Siegel, who was a real expert on titanium, because they took the tie and they put it under an electron microscope, and it was determined to have contained numerous rare metals, rare metallic particles, and that becomes an equally big part of the mystery. How and why would these things be on his tie? What type of profession did D.B. Cooper have? And I just want to share something with you guys. On a recent Cooper Friday episode, I did it, one called, Was D.B. Cooper a Canadian? And I was telling a story about how somebody was saying that Americans don't know how Canadians sound, like Americans can't differentiate between a standard American accent and a standard Canadian accent. And this all ties into something that is on a pure personal note. I was just thinking about that same person. What actually happened was, I was trying to go on a date with a girl who was Canadian, and she was keeping me in the friend zone, and I showed up to the date, and she brought her mom as a third wheel, and I just couldn't believe that that actually happened. And, I, I mean, it's odd what you remember, but her mother was eating split pea soup the whole time, and, and the reason I remember that is because she was moving it around in circles in a very unnecessary reason. But she was telling me the story, her mom was telling me the story, of how she had an ex-boyfriend who was a... Uh, metallurgist and a scientist that studied rare metals, and then he ultimately ended up concentrating in mercury science, and then he just left Canada, he left the country and never told her and disappeared. And I was like, huh, well, you know, there are lots of mysteries along the way, I suppose. And after that, I began to think, okay, well, things probably won't work out with this Canadian girl who brought her mom on a date, but I began to wonder, if I were to specialize and focus on one particular element to be a scientist, what would it be? And I thought titanium, absolutely titanium, the connections to planes, bicycles, strong, durable, holds up under highest speeds. Yes, absolutely titanium. So for about 45 minutes, I thought, you know what? I could do that. Titanium science, be a titaniumologist. And part of me still regrets not actually doing that. Instead, I ended up as the host of Black Box Online Radio, which I don't mind at all. And if you would like to hear more about this, you can check out Darren Schaefer's interview on the Cooper Vortex with Stan Siegel about what a real scientist and someone from the International Titanium Association thinks about the rare metals on D.B. Cooper's tie. But to provide a more basic introduction, I'm going to go over to an article from News Nation that will tell us a little bit more info about the tie. It's called, Could a J.C. Penny Tie Hold the Secret to D.B. Cooper's Identity? D.B. Cooper is the center of America's only unsolved hijacking by plane, and he parachuted at 10,000 feet with $200,000 in cash strapped to his waist in 1971. 
Cooper boarded a jet in Portland, Oregon, and hijacked the flight, saying that he had a bomb and he was asking for cash and four parachutes. Once he received the money, he let the passengers go and the flight took off again, heading toward Reno, Nevada, which was a planned refueling stop before heading to Mexico. But somewhere near Vancouver, Washington, and Portland, Oregon, Cooper jumped out of the plane, and he was never heard from again. The independent investigator, Eric Eulis, thinks that the answer to this lies on a black tie, which was a clip-on from J.C. Penney. The tie was one of the items Cooper left behind on the jet in 1971. It didn't prove to be much of use to the investigators. But as technology has evolved, tools like electron microscopes and DNA analysis have made it much more valuable. Particles were pulled from the tie that are unique and rare to the aerospace sector, and specifically a company called Crucible Steel that no longer exists. Firstly, I mean, with the amount of evidence that D.B. Cooper left behind, cigarettes, touching things, and it's not just the glass. I've also talked to Pat Boland, who closely follows the D.B. Cooper case. D.B. Cooper handled the four parachutes, but he didn't use all of them. And when he handled the parachutes, he also could have left behind touch DNA. There is no way this case would ever have gone unsolved in 2024 with the amount of physical evidence that would have been left behind. They would have been tracking him so easily if he had jumped out of the plane, and they would have known all of his exact movements with the advancements in technology. It is just, um, I think it's the time frame why D.B. Cooper was able to get away. The tie was examined, and the particles can even pin can even point to a specific lab in which the company had a headquarters in, and that is in Pennsylvania. Eric Hewlett said he obtained a DNA profile from the scientist named Tom Kay, who analyzed the tie in 2009 and 2011. It's very exciting because it gives us the opportunity once and for all to say that I believe to eventually figure out precisely who this guy was. And you know what? Um, no matter what you think about Eric Hewlett or the D.B. Cooper case, I appreciate that type of optimism. I appreciate that it almost thinks that, I mean, by that, I mean, I appreciate the optimism in the sense that someone thinks that the case can actually be solved, and we are getting closer and closer to getting a specific answer. Now, I would like to also go over to um, dbcooperhijack.com and look at some more specific things about the tie that was left behind. D.B. Cooper left his clip-on tie on the plane before he jumped out, possibly as a calling card. I personally believe that this was done... I'm quoting the article, mind you. I personally believe that this was done as a final screw you to the man. The tie may have been his, or very possibly stolen from someone in management at his company. In 2017, the FBI allowed a group of researchers called the Citizen Sleuths to analyze the tie. Their analysis discovered many particles found in manufacturing environments, leading many to believe that D.B. Cooper was a manager or an engineer in a manufacturing facility. And here is a summary. One of the particles that was found was a spiral aluminum shaving, and that's just one that stands out. The evidence suggests that this tie could have been worn by a rail yard manager, freight, freight agent, or clerk, or one of the customers. Contrary to the popular belief, it did not come from the pristine environment of an aircraft engineering facility. The evidence is suggesting that Cooper could have worked in the industrial hub of the northeastern part of the United States, very possibly for a railroad. It is just one more piece of circumstantial evidence. One of the main scientists, Tom Kay, recently gave a talk at the D.B. Cooper conference in 2018. He showed a picture of the tie and compared it to one worn by a Boeing engineer for many years. He noted how clean the Boeing engineer's tie was under the microscope and how it looked different from D.B. Cooper's tie. And I'm going to get to the part that I think you guys want to hear a little bit more about, and they would be the exact metals that were found on D.B. Cooper's tie. Silicone, calcium, iron, unclassified, uh, so mysterious, aluminum, salts, titanium, antimony, bismuth chloride, chlorine, nickel, calcium phosphorus, magnesium, gold, zinc, copper, barium sulfate, tin, sodium sulfur, 300 series SS, chromium, phosphorus, zirconium, brass, sodium, erosion, bromine, and um, final four, there were zeros, but everything you heard had some type of small quantity. And I know that not all of those are metals, but still a lot of rare elements that were found 
on D.B. Cooper's tie, and there's an additional paragraph here that I would just like to read. Steel is an alloy of iron and carbon, and sometimes other elements. While iron alloyed with carbon is called carbon steel, alloy steel is one that allows the alloying of other elements that have been intentionally added to modify the characteristics of the steel. So I think they're trying to point out that there could have been a very specific reason, and it wouldn't have been extremely uncommon for D.B. Cooper to have had a tie that would have had these metallic particles, or these specific metallic particles when found together, wouldn't necessarily be that bizarre if he worked with steel to a certain capacity. But what do you think so far? Do you think that this is evidence that T.B. Cooper worked in the aerospace industry? Now, some of the other things that I just can't get over. D.B. Cooper really understood the airplanes. He really knew a lot about the airplanes. And as I was listening to the Cooper Vortex, Darren Schaefer was talking about how it's almost as if Maybe the airplane mechanic would know certain things that the pilot wouldn't, and the pilot would know certain things that the airplane mechanic wouldn't. Because D.B. Cooper just knew so much about airplanes, about flying the plane at 10,000 feet and adjusting the rudders in a certain way to slow the speed of the plane. But um, he knew where the oxygen tanks were. However, he just didn't seem to know absolutely everything about the way that a plane would function. Some other pieces of info would be that he referred to the interphone as an interphone. He told the flight attendants things about going to their stations as opposed to, um, well, any other type of terminology. The way a layperson might say that place in the back or something like that. Can you get something from the back? Using terminology that someone who was familiar with aircrafts. Note that that's not like airplane mechanics right there, but just familiar with the actual interior of the aircraft, I just think that that's so puzzling. And if people have certain suspects, they try to make them fit. But the amount of evidence that has been left behind, I mean, I just I just can't get over this. This guy would have been sitting in that seat for hours, you know, leaving behind all types of things. Like, these days, if you're just sitting in a room and you're breathing, you're going to leave behind some type of DNA, let alone touch DNA, your clothing fibers, how about just even the treads of your shoes are going to leave something behind that, that can be traced back. But this was in 1971, so a lot of the processing technologies that they had that we look at on forensic files just didn't exist. And I would actually like to go to an article from foxweather.com, and this is a one from 2024. And at first I thought it was Fox News, but I had to check again. Yes, this is foxweather.com. New evidence discovered in the D.B. Cooper skyjacking case. In Seattle, a microscopic metal, metal fragment was found on the infamous tie of plane hijacker D.B. Cooper, and this could reveal his true identity. Private investigator and researcher Eric Eulis is ringing in the new year with new breadcrumbs to share. I would not be surprised at all if 2024 was the year when we finally figure out who this guy was. And an additional note about the optimism... I do think that this case is solvable. I mean, it's an uphill battle about how poorly this evidence was preserved. But I do think that this case is solvable. The particle is part stainless steel and part titanium. Eulis believes that the itsy bitsy discovery can be traced back to a sophisticated metal fabric shop. And according to Eulis, and his le the legendary disappearance of D.B. Cooper 52 years ago left behind a critical clue a clip-on tie. After the money and the man vanished without a trace, this possession was spotted on Cooper's seat on the back row of seat 18E, to be exact. Eula said the tie was purchased at a J.C. Penney around Christmas time in 1964 for $1.49. The evidence is currently under federal lock and key, but scientists who examined it were able to pull more than 1,000, excuse me, 100,000 particles from it. He applied these sticky stubs they're like little carbon circles that he could use to get portions of the tie. And then when you pull them off, you're pulling off some of the particles from the tie, explained Eric Eulis. You apply the modern state-of-the-art technology to it, which they didn't have back in 1971, and this occurred and it tells the story. Eighteen months ago, Eric Eulis used the U.S. patents to trace three of these fragments from the tie to a specific plant in Pennsylvania called Crucible Steel. Headquartered in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, a significant subcontractor 
all throughout the 1960s said Eulis, it is supplying the lion's share of titanium for stainless steel for Boeing's aircraft at the time. Now, Eulis claimed that the evidence points to D.B. Cooper having an in-depth knowledge of the 727 he hijacked out of the Sierra, Seattle area, and workers at Crucible Steel were known to travel and visit their contractor, Boeing. So this will tie into a suspect that Eric Eulis is going to talk about, named Vince Peterson. And I'm going to have to do a standalone episode on Vince Peterson, because I really want to just devote the entire segment to him and all of his observations. But right now, I would like to ask you guys a couple of challenge questions. But first, I would like to remind you guys that if you like listening to Cooper Friday, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And you can also go through some of the links in the description box. One of them is for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnit88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. The first challenge question is, what do you think of that thing from... D.B. Cooper hijack that says the reason why the tie was left behind was because D.B. Cooper wanted to just give a final screw you to the man. What do you think about that? As I said, I've had the opportunity to talk to Pat Boland, and I also watched her interview on Drew Beeson's channel talking all about D.B. Cooper, and they provided a rather different type of explanation, and that was that maybe D.B. Cooper just left it behind because he didn't want it when he was jumping out of the plane. He thought that the tie could cause interference. Now, this, again, might suggest that it's somebody who has a type of paratrooping background, although it'd be, it's kind of an odd thing to leave behind. How hard would it be to fold it up and put it into his pocket or maybe into some other type of bag? He had multiple bags with him, right? So it's kind of an odd thing to leave behind. Was this done as a gesture that was meant to say a screw you to the man? I guess I'm leaning more toward um, what Pat Boland said, though, about he just didn't want it flapping in his face when he was jumping out of the plane. But the thing that I've really thought about, and I might be completely wrong about this, but maybe D.B. Cooper was expecting that they couldn't extract any type of fingerprints from the tie because he wouldn't have known about DNA technology in 1971, but he thought, they're not going to get any real evidence off of this, so it doesn't really matter. I can just toss it to the side. I don't need it anymore. And... Sometimes you can even see this in action movies or something when the villain is getting a little bit heated or pissed off. He just takes off his tie. And I don't think that Cooper would have been angry. I think that he would have just been like, it's an impractical thing to have and just leaves it behind. Now, other people have brought up the possibility of how maybe this tie didn't actually belong to D.B. Cooper. I think that that is completely incorrect. I mean, I don't know everything 100%, but I believe that to be incorrect for the following reason. It's found where he was sitting. He would have been the last person on the plane. I don't think there's any reason to expect that that tie came from somebody else. Now, the question of, did he take it from the thrift store? Did he steal it from somebody? Was it from somebody else's closet? Did he borrow it from someone? No idea. But I also think that that would be a little bit unlikely. In fact, I, d I just don't see any reason why D.B. Cooper wouldn't wear his own tie if he was going on the plane, again, thinking that the evidence wouldn't be traced back to him. And so far, it's been over 50 years, and the evidence hasn't led to a specific person who has been 100% identified as D.B. Cooper. So I just think he took it off for practical reasons. But what do you think? Why did D.B. Cooper leave the tie behind on the plane? Now, I told you guys that I listened to the Cooper Vortex episode with Stuart McAdam, which I heard on Spotify. You can also download Black Box Online Radio on Spotify under the names Black Box Podcast or Black Box True Crime. That's how you can find it. But when I was listening to Stuart McAdam's episode on the Cooper Vortex, he was providing a very level-headed approach that challenged a lot of the things that I've been talking about here on Cooper Friday. For example, I've really been going down the pathway of something... CIA or FBI related in terms of a cover-up. I've really been looking at the suspects such as Ted Braden and E. Howard Hunt, and no matter what, I think Ted Braden is a strong suspect because Drew Beeson, who's the author of Paratrooper of Fortune and has Ted Braden as his suspect, states that, who would you want to do this again? Like, if you had to go through the list of all the known D.B. Cooper suspects, who would you want I mean, and he was like, I would choose Ted Braden, and I would too. Ted Braden was an excellent skydiver and paratrooper. Um, not only was he ex-Special Forces, but also a Congo mercenary, and he was somebody who really knew what he was doing. He could have pulled this off without breaking a sweat. 
And I did mention E. Howard Hunt a second ago, and when I first learned about E. Howard Hunt as a D.B. Cooper suspect, I thought it was the most ridiculous thing in the world. I was like, no way. E. Howard Hunt was a Watergate conspirator. He was a high-profile individual. He's somebody who you would see on national television. Being D.B. Cooper, that's out of the question. But I think even Darren Shaver said it the best. The more you look at the case, the more you begin to think that E. Howard Hunt is somewhat of a viable suspect. Now, I heard this interview with Stuart McAdam, who's also been a guest on this program talking about D.B. Cooper. We did an episode called The Zodiac Killer, D.B. Cooper in Cyberspace, which I invite you to check out. But Stuart McAdam just dropped a no-nonsense level approach by saying, this whole thing about a CIA or FBI cover-up has insufficient evidence to support it. For the following reason, the FBI was trying hard to solve the case. The people who were involved with the investigations were trying hard to solve the case. Larry Carr, the FBI agent who was primarily devoted to the case, even appeared on the Cooper Vortex openly stating that he wanted to solve the case. If this was all just a cover-up from the CIA or the FBI, or planned by the CIA or the FBI, they really didn't cover up all of the ends all of the loose ends, and wouldn't somebody doing an independent investigation 50 years later have been able to connect the dots and figure it out? So maybe I was using this type of CIA, FBI angle as a convenient answer as to why all the evidence was gone. And Stewart also challenged a lot of the popular conspiracy theories out there, which I don't endorse, such as the flight crew was behind everything, D.B. Cooper was hiding in a secret compartment, and he never actually jumped out of the plane. And if you want to talk about not jumping out of the plane, we can have that discussion later on, but the fact that the flight crew would have been involved with this, what that Tina Mucklow or something is behind it all, no, I just, I just also think there's insufficient evidence for that. And never mind that they didn't get to spend the money. The money did not end up in circulation. But I really appreciated Stuart McAdam's breakdown of how the Cooper skyjacking would have taken place. D.B. Cooper's on the plane. The aft staircase goes down. He jumps out of the plane, and he loses the money. Perhaps he thought he knew what he was doing by able to being able to secure the $200,000 to his apparatus, but he lost the money. And then the money lands in the Lewis River or the Columbia River, and then it's transported some way, somehow, to Tina Bar, and that the money that was found at Tina Bar in 1980 got there by natural causes, maybe from the dredge, even if you count that, as some type of some type of cause that wasn't specifically planting it there, because a lot of people insist that the money was planted there by D.B. Cooper, and, I mean, we could talk about the money for an entire episode, but it really just was a no-nonsense approach. The money got away from him when he was jumping through the air. He successfully landed it at a place and then was just able to get back to civilization. So I appreciate a lot of the observations from Stuart McAdam. And what do you think about any of that? What do you think about the money, $5,800 that ended up at Tina Bar, just falling off D.B. Cooper from the air, and that lands in one of the rivers? And then D.B. Cooper just lands successfully, mind you, but without the money. So in some ways, he almost lost his life and he didn't get to spend the money at all. And that the money, the rest of the money just went to the bottom of the river and was destroyed by the elements. And it will never, ever be found again. I would love to know your response to that. And also, what do you think about saying that any type of CIA or FBI cover-up is implausible? Please give your take on that in the comments section. But also, also... I really want to know, what is your response to this? Why do you believe that D.B. Cooper left the tie behind on the plane? I would love to um, read your answers to that challenge question. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you over there. Until next time.